Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. As I'm sure you've heard by now, the great Trump legal world tour has officially begun with Trump currently in New York standing trial in the infamous Stormy Daniels hush money case. And through all the coverage that's been done on this case so far, really two perspectives have emerged. One is that this is a witch hunt out to get to the innocent and perfect angel that is Donald Trump. And the other is throw that fascist dictator in prison. I don't care how, I don't care why, just throw him in prison. You're driving too fast, jail. Slow, jail. You make an appointment with a dentist and you don't show up, believe it or not, jail, right away. But honestly, I really just haven't heard a lot of real legal analysis of the issues involved in the case and whether or not Trump is actually guilty of having committed this crime. So today I figured I'd give an overview of the case, providing you, the viewer, with the key facts involved, the legal issues that are actually being considered here, and the arguments that are being made by both sides. So let's not waste any more time. Let's get straight into it. In the Biden justice system, Trump-based offenses are considered especially heinous. The district attorneys who prosecute these vicious felonies are part of an elite squad known as the Soros Purchase Unit. Here are their stories. <laughs> So let's get started by just going through the timeline and the key events that got us to where we are today. So we begin the story in 2006, which was a simpler time, a time where the only things Americans had to worry about were two simultaneous wars in the Middle East, a Category 5 hurricane ravaging the state of Louisiana, and a looming housing bubble that would go on to nearly destroy capitalism. In July of that year, real estate billionaire and reality TV show star Donald John Trump, who had just married his third wife, Slovenian model Melania, the year prior, allegedly had an affair with an adult film actress named Stormy Daniels. Stormy Daniels was one of the most prominent adult film actresses at the time, uh, known for her starring roles in classics such as The Witches of Brestwick, Breast Friends 2, Space Nuts, I could go on, and I will. Operation Desert Stormy, Operation Tropical Stormy, Sexbots Program for Pleasure, and of course, Oppenheimer. Nearly 10 years later, on June 16, 2015, Donald Trump comes down the now infamous golden escalator in Trump Tower in New York and announces that he's running for president. After essentially beheading the entire Republican field, Rand Paul shouldn't even be on this stage. I am not sitting in the United States Senate with, by the way, the worst voting record there is. Your the brother Obama. and your brother's administration gave us Barack Obama. Trump eventually secures the Republican nomination and ends up in a one-on-one -on -one general election matchup against Hillary Rodham Clinton. Well, this has been a lot of fun, Mrs. Clinton. We should stay in touch. What's the best way to reach you? Email? In October 2016, about a month before the election, the Trump campaign became embroiled in what is now known as the Access Hollywood scandal. When you're a star, they let you do it. You can do anything. <laughs> Whatever you want. Grab them by the <laughs> I can do anything. In the midst of the scandal, Stormy Daniels apparently began the process of selling her story about her affair with Trump to various media outlets. On October 26, Trump's attorney, Michael Cohen, opened a bank account for a new company called Essential Consultants LLC, and then used his personal home equity to transfer $130,000 into that LLC's account. The very next day, Michael Cohen wired that $130,000 to Stormy Daniels' attorney as part of an agreement whereby Stormy Daniels would refrain from discussing the affair she had with Trump. And this whole process of how the payment was carried out was done this way intentionally to make sure that Trump was not directly linked to this hush money payment to Stormy Daniels. Although Stormy Daniels was prohibited from discussing the affair, story of the affair eventually made its way to numerous media outlets with other adult film stars confirming the relationship. Over the next several months, Trump issues a number of payments to Michael Cohen to reimburse him for that $130,000. Uh, and he logs these payments as legal retainer fees and bonuses, not as part of some reimbursement for this payment. The sh** really hit the fan on April 9th, 2018, when FBI agents raided the office of Michael Cohen, seizing emails, tax documents, and business records related to several matters, including the payment that he made to Daniels. On August 21st, 2018, Michael Cohen officially surrendered to the FBI and ultimately pled guilty to eight charges, five counts of tax evasion, one count of making false statements to a financial institution, one count of willfully causing an unlawful corporate contribution, and one count of making an excessive campaign contribution at the request of a candidate or a campaign. That last one is the important one because that's how we get to this case here. The theory here was that that $130,000 payment was actually an illegal campaign contribution, which exceeded the $2,700 individual contribution limit for federal elections. Presumably, as part of a plea deal, Michael Cohen is eventually sentenced to three years imprisonment, of which he only serves about one year, 
And then he proceeds to flip on Trump. While the DOJ did consider charging Trump with violations of campaign finance law, they ultimately chose not to, largely because of the precedent against indicting sitting presidents and because they felt that they lacked the necessary evidence and reliable witness testimony that they would need to convict him. In November of 2020, the absolute worst year in the history of humanity, former Vice President Joe Biden defeats Donald Trump in the 2020 election, which Trump takes, well, After Trump left office, there were increasing calls on the left for Trump to be charged with something, anything. And that's where this guy comes in. This is Hungarian billionaire hedge fund manager, George Soros. Depending on who you ask, Soros is either a progressive Santa Claus or the offspring of Emperor Palpatine and every Bond villain ever. Do you expect me to talk? No, Mr. Bond, I expect you to die. For years, Soros has been a major financier for liberal campaigns all across the United States through individual contributions, contributions from his family members, and through political action committees. I mention this because kind of under the radar in the late 2010s and early 2020s, Soros began dramatically increasing his contributions to local district attorney elections, which get a lot less attention, money, and focus, which makes them easier to win if you have the right backer. His stated goal for making these contributions was to essentially influence local justice systems by electing DAs who would pursue more lenient and progressive policies regarding prosecution and sentencing, and would adopt criminal justice reforms aimed at reducing mass incarceration. And all that seems to be working out just great. Surging crime being blamed for the closure of an enormous 65,000 square foot grocery store in San Francisco. Body parts were found yeah. all over Long Island. They had four suspects. They let them go. Right. And right. now they're out there still. So what, what no. is the deal here? Right, right. It sounds right. insane. Some critics of Soros were raising the alarm around this time because they thought that Soros might have an ulterior motive, helping elect DAs who would actually try to prosecute Trump before the 2024 election. Which brings us to November 2nd, 2021 when Soros-backed Alvin Bragg was elected to be the next New York County District Attorney. Earlier that year, Soros had contributed a million dollars to the political action committee, Color of Change, which coincidentally pledged to spend $1 million on Bragg's campaign. Following his election, Bragg began to aggressively pursue the hush money case. The pertinent statute, section 175.10, states that a person is guilty of falsifying business records in the first degree when he commits the crime of falsifying business records in the second degree and when his intent to defraud includes an intent to commit another crime or to aid or conceal the commission thereof. Now, crimes under this statute are generally brought as a misdemeanor. Uh, in order to rise to a felony, you have to have committed this falsifying of a business record in furtherance of committing another crime. And what makes this case very odd is typically when a felony charge for violating the statute is brought, it's usually not brought alone. Usually they are brought alongside the crime that apparently the person was trying to commit when they falsified the business records. That wasn't done here. The only charges brought in the indictment are the falsifying business records charges. And for some time, the prosecution argued that they didn't have to list what crime Trump was trying to commit, that they could just kind of vaguely allude to criminal activity that Trump was engaged in. When Trump filed a motion to dismiss the case, he lost. But the prosecution was required to list the supposed crimes that they claimed Trump was trying to commit when he allegedly falsified business documents. The prosecution eventually said that those were violations of federal campaign finance law, violations of the New York election law, and violations of federal, local, and state tax law. So looking at the arguments that have been raised by both sides, the prosecution is essentially arguing that Trump violated New York's falsifying business records statute when he improperly recorded his reimbursement payments to Michael Cohen as legal retainer fees. Because the payment to Daniels was made to prevent damaging revelations from coming out that could have impacted Trump's 2016 presidential campaign, the prosecution argues that this was essentially an undisclosed in-kind contribution to his campaign that violated federal campaign finance laws. The greatest strength the prosecution has is Michael Cohen, Trump's own attorney, who apparently is going to testify that Trump not only knew about the payment, but that he was aware that the intent of the payment was to keep Stormy Daniels quiet, so that way the story of the affair that they had wouldn't destroy his presidential campaign. 
On the defense side, the Trump team argues that the $130,000 payment to Stormy Daniels was a legitimate and legal personal expenditure by Trump to prevent personal embarrassment or harm to his family, and wasn't an illegal campaign contribution intended to influence the 2016 election. The defense claims that the prosecution's attempt here to reinterpret the payment as an illegal campaign expenditure even when federal prosecutors who have the authority to charge Trump for this have refused to do so, shows that the prosecution's legal theory is nothing more than a politically motivated attempt to get Trump. And they claim that this is further evidenced by the fact that they've had all of this evidence for years. I mean, they could have charged Trump in 2020, 2021, 2022, but instead they chose to wait and bring the charges now to force Trump to stand trial just months before the 2024 election. So what are my thoughts on the case? Well, as a quick note off the top, I'll say that when anything comes up related to Trump, I always try to be as objective as I possibly can be, especially when it concerns the law. If I think he's innocent, I'll tell you. If I think he's guilty, like with the classified documents case, I'll tell you. Here, I'm just thoroughly unpersuaded by the prosecution. I just don't see how you can frame this payment as some sort of campaign contribution, uh, especially considering the fact that just because somebody makes a personal expenditure that may benefit their own campaign, doesn't necessarily mean that that expenditure itself is a campaign contribution. For example, if a candidate for office gets a gym membership because he or she wants to lose some weight for an upcoming debate, and I'm here to tell you that you don't have to be stuck with what you got. That is not necessarily a campaign contribution under the law. The Federal Election Commission applies something called the quote-unquote irrespective test, which essentially asks whether the expense would exist irrespective of the candidate's election campaign. And this is a critical distinction because it's an analysis of the nature of the payment itself, not even the intent behind the payment. So even if the gym membership was specifically to get in shape for that debate, or in this case, if a payment was made to stop a porn star from blabbing about an affair you had and tank your presidential election, as long as it's a type of payment that the candidate would have incurred even if they weren't running for office, then that expense is not really a campaign expense. As far as my prediction, look, I try not to be cynical about judges or juries, no matter where they're from. I think any judge and any jury is capable of considering the facts of a case reasonably and rationally. Um, but that being said, given the, some of the rulings that have come from the judge, I feel fairly confident in saying that Trump is very likely to be convicted in this case. As far as sentencing goes, Trump could face up to four years in prison for each count he's convicted on. That being said, it is very rare to see somebody get actual prison time for violating the statute when they're a first-time offender. So my expectation is that Trump will likely not see any jail time, but will probably pay some heavy fines and penalties. But that's just my opinion. I look forward to hearing all of yours in the comments. If you enjoyed this video, please like, share, and subscribe. Thank you as always for watching. Always really appreciate it. And as always, please don't cheat on your wife with a porn star. <laughs>